Australia developed around a vast space considered to be empty, but which is in fact teeming with life and is referred to as the bush. It has contributed strongly to the development of the Australian identity and is indissociable from the country's image and collective subconscious. The Australian bush is present in all walks of life, whether it be films, songs, books and children's books in particular. Uh, as this is my first PowerPoint presentation, you may assume there has been a mix-up in the pictures you can see on the screen. Well, in fact, it's only because of the reaction I invariably get when answering the what's your thesis about question. And as no one's ever heard of Mel Gibbs outside of Australia, people tend to assume the name I utter is Mel Gibson. And the funny thing about it is that they, are, that, is that they share more than just the same initials. Oops, sorry. Both are artists who are, who are versatile and prolific in their field. Mel Gibson is an American-born Australian actor, film director, producer and screenwriter. Cecilia May Gibbs was an English-born Australian illustrator, cartoonist, columnist and children's book author. Both were born abroad and migrated to Australia as children. Both received prestigious awards Gibson for his services to the Australian film industry and May Gibbs in acknowledgement of her important contribution to Australian children's literature. This could be hard to believe given that early in his career Gibson was dubbed in Mad Max because he sounded too Aussie. While the first children's story that May Gibbs wrote was rejected by English publishers as too Australian. Another important common trait is a link to World War I, which was a deeply formative time for the Australian identity. In 1981, Mel Gibson starred in the film Gallipoli, which was immensely popular in Australia. The film depicts the Anzacs, Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, who were part of the British, for uh, British for French force attempting to capture the Dardanelles in Turkey. But not only was the landing on the Gallipoli Peninsula a massive military failure, but it was also a carnage with soldiers killed by the thousands. Surprisingly, since 1916, Australia's greatest military defeat has acquired iconic status due to the unmistakable evidence of Anzac's sacrifice and is commemorated on April the 25th. As for May Gibbs, who was 37 at the time, the outbreak of the First World War saw her contract for a series of magazine covers cut short. Instead, she chose to contribute to the war effort by creating postcards, as shown on the screen, that features bushland characters and animals that were sent by families and in Red Cross parcels to the Anzac soldiers across the world. The, these helped establish the foundation of her fans and held pride of praise in the nation's psyche during a time of turmoil. May Gibbs invented a novel fantasy, uh, sorry, May Gibbs invented a novel fantasy world in which the Australian bush takes the lion's share. Here are a few images of the Australian bush featuring two of its most common and emblematic trees, the native eucalyptus gum tree and banksia trees referred to as old man banksia. Sorry, I need to drink. <laughs> Sorry. Both species display dramatic, showy, and beautiful flowers, but only, but also not so nice-looking fruit in the shape of nuts or, or seed pod cones. As the two most abundant species of trees in Australia, they share a significant place in the Australian cultural landscape, and they feature heavily in May Gibbs stories. May Gibbs understood that the Australian environment could be alive with personality and set her gumnet baby stories in the bush. In fact, they're often referred to as May Gibbs bushland babies. In 1916, she said, 
On all the big gum trees, there are gum nut babies. Some people see them and some don't, but they see everybody and everything. She realised that Australian trees could sprout characters that live in children's imaginations and sometimes even haunt them. Her fanciful work revolves around the gum trees, from the leaves that she turned into clothes to the gum tree fruit, also known as nut, that she turned into male characters such as Snugglepot and Cuddle Pie, and the gum tree flowers, also known, also known as blossoms, that she turned into female characters like Little Ragged Blossom. In every story, she opposes these innocent and infantile gum nut babies against the frightening big bed Banksyamin. As you can see, it's very easy to see gruff and slightly villainous faces in these seed pods. May Gibbs' illustrations depict an accurate vision of the true Australian bush. She used her stories to teach children that the bush is a rich, natural resource that provides whatever is needed, including food, such as snake meat for the kookaburra, which is an Australian kingfisher, and aphid milk. It also provides a shelter, such as marsupial pouches, transport, such as hopping kangaroos as cabs, and a means of communication with the news straight from the daily bark, referring to a type of eucalyptus called the scribbly gum tree. Its distinctive feature is the scribbles, made by the moth larvae it, it plays host to, that leave scribbly burrowing patterns as they tunnel under the bark, as you can see in the last image. The outdoor nature of the bush provides the grounds for something Australians strongly identify with, sport. Now, think about the world's major sports for a minute. Lawn bowling, rowing, soccer, cricket, tennis and rugby, to name a few. And you'll realise that many of them were invented in Britain. They spread around the globe, along the, with British settlements, and still play a major role in these nations' cultures. Rowing, for example, has developed into the popular outdoor sports and surfing in Australia. Likewise, Australian rules football, or footy for short, branched off, branched off from English rugby as early as 1858. In fact, her postcard featuring the football scrum strongly reminds me of this contact sport that is uniquely Australian. Sport teaches us values such as resilience, leadership, accountability and respect, as well as tenacity, the ability to fail, teamwork and discipline. This leads to the values of solidarity, kindness and mateship that are found in every walk of life in the bush, as seen by May Gibbs, and that are an integral part of Australian identity. Whether it be a medicine jar to cure cuddle pie's toothaches, notice the scribbly writing on the gum leaf by the dentist who is, by the way, a praying mantis or Mrs. Lizard using her body as a bridge to help gumnet babies cross over a billabong, the gumnet babies helping to save a possum caught in a trap set by humans. As for the last picture, it tells the story of Mrs. Fantail, who came back to an empty nest and couldn't get over the loss of her eggs. One of her bush friends kindly replaced them, but she turned out to be raising baby lizard, so now she's literally grounded. These values are taught to children often through storybooks, while adults can learn through magazines and newspapers. May Gibbs' best-selling children's series, featuring the Gumnet babies, their friends and their foes, established an enduring mythology of the Australian bush for generations raised firmly on traditional European legends and fairy tales. And don't you agree that the image of a stork delivering a new baby is something everyone can identify with. In 1920, Gibbs was commissioned by the government for a public health poster for the first ever Baby Week and to encourage mothers to attend baby clinics. The resulting artwork, entitled Dr. Stork and Mrs. Kookaburra, is one of her most celebrated images. It was immensely popular 
and was still in use until 1959. May Gibbs' local version of the stork, stork delivering a human baby to a mother has been transitioned to a gamnet baby delivered to a kookaburra. She made it unmistakably Australian by adding a gum leaf border and the snippet of advice from the complaining stork, damn humans, is so gum careless of them. Just as owls are traditionally associated with wisdom and knowledge in European folklore, May Gibbs again gives this role to Mrs. Kookaburra as a knowledgeable, reliable, educational and motherly figure. In this illustration, she is lecturing very quiet and focused gamnet babies, unless it's bedtime story. While you may think that today her writing is out of date, she was in fact dealing with very current issues. May Gibbs was a very talented and shrewd businesswoman. As early as 1913, she took out Commonwealth copyright, copyright registrations on six of her uh, most popular designs, starting with her gum leaf bookmark, just in time for the Christmas sales, then flannel flower babies, Christmas bell babies, bottle brush babies, bottle babies, and finally native rose uh, babies. She was a keen advocate for the preservation of native flora and fauna. In 1918, she revealed herself as a committed co conservationist with the, op the opening inscription in her book, The Tales of Snugglepot and Cuddle Pie, Humans, please be kind to old bush old bull, uh, sorry. Humans, please be kind to old bush creatures and don't pull flowers up by the roots. Her concern was rec recognized and a year later, May Gibbs was made a life member of the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. She also championed recycling at the second-hand market, such as selling second-hand insect house to gum nuts. In 1919, she produced another public health poster that we can all relate to, in which she promotes the use of a mask to limit the spread of the Spanish flu. Of course, the masks, the cucabra and the gum nut baby wear, are made out of a gum leaf. Whilst May never portrayed herself as a feminist, she actively supported the vote for women and equal pay and was commissioned to draw two covers for a magazine supporting the suffragette cause. Furthermore, in 1924, upon hearing that her male colleague, cartoonist, was being paid a lot more than she was for, a, for her extremely popular Bib and Bub comic strip in the Sunday News, she put action into work. In 1925, she crossed over to the rival newspaper, The Sunday Sun, which published her second equally popular cartoon strip featuring the pipe-smoking pig Tiggy Touchwood, but this time under the male uh, pseudonym Stan Cotman. Her professional life, having spanned over half a century, May Gibbs used an incredible array of supports for her work. From the humble gum leaf bookmark that was to become a signature design to a popular Bib and Bub cartoon strip in print from 1924 to until late 1967, becoming Australia's long longest running comic strip. In 1918, her most ambitious work to date, Tales of Snugglepot of Cuddle Pie, was published and was ardently scooped up by the Australian public, followed by two sequels, Little Ragged Blossom in 1920 and Little Billia in 1921. As mentioned, she also produced postcards during World War I, public health posters and magazine covers. She also wrote a regular column and, you, and drew political cartoons in various newspapers. In sharp, in sharp contrast to this wealth of media, in May Gibbs' depiction of the Australian bush, there is a glaring lack of quintessential part of Australia, the Aboriginal people. She added fantasy elements to her vision of the Australian bush to create a, a very own version of indigenous folklore based on a colorful and accurate depiction of the flora, fauna and life in the bush. Alas, it is blatantly missing any aboriginals. With only a single occurrence um, among her many published children's books, 
with the text, and I quote, in the middle of a large rail of space, upon a wonderful steed, sat a dark red skin nut, unquote. This is likely a reflection of the Australian society's attitude at the time towards Aboriginals when they didn't have a respected position in society. At the time, the so-called Australian identity depended heavily on the white Anglo-Celtic male viewpoint, which had the effect of excluding the existence of the Aboriginal nations, ignoring their numerous and varied clan identities. This is ironic, given that the Aboriginals are the original bush people, with a very close symbiotic relationship with the bush. Known to be great storytellers and expert hunters and gatherers, with sophisticated ways of taking care of the land. These are all the themes that Gibbs promoted throughout her life and work. Every fairy tale, legend, or children's book contains an element of negativity that more often than not takes the shape of a villain, an element used as a sidekick so that the hero or main character can ooze virtues. Snugglepot and Cuddle Pie is no exception with the beat bad Banksy men. These black and hairy characters look rather ugly, threatening and frightening. Even more, the Banksy trees are home to many gangs of them, busily plotting against the gumnit babies and their friends. And three other stories, they always side with Mrs. Snake in their quest to harm the gumnit babies they hate so much. Many have suggested that the big bad Banksy men could represent uh, First Nations people as they were prevalent in the bush and yet at the same time either they were never seen or they were not acknowledged. Was this out of fear, indifference or mere racism by the white society? Only God knows. Today it seems we've come the full circle. Interestingly, if we go back in time to 1910, we find May Gibbs' very first children's story which was set in the Australian bush. However, this story, entitled Minnie and Wog, of a little white girl and her dog, was never published because it was deemed by English publishers as too Australian. In this original story, that should have seen the debut of May Gibbs as a combined author and illustrator, there is an old native woman smoking a pipe and talking to her dogs. And I quote, Mammy said, please dear Mrs. Black Woman, don't be cross, we are so cold, let us sit by the fire. If we follow the assumption that the Big Bad Banksy men represent Aboriginal people, then the illustration in the top right hand corner could depict an Aboriginal man who is begging a little white naked girl for mercy in Little Obelia in 1921. May Gibbs repurposed the characters of Mimi and Wog, their adventures in Australia, and placed them on the rooftops of Edwardian London a fantastic realm inhabited by chimney pot people. It was published in London and New York in 1912 as About Us. This chimney pot land is likely to have foreshadowed the treetop world of the bushland babies. About Us was never published in Australia, but in September last year, Scholastic Australia published it in Australia for the first time with a slightly different title, Mammy and Wag. Despite May Gibbs' presence and reputation in Australia as an iconic author, there is a total lack of awareness in the rest of the world, as she's never been published outside of Australia, nor translated into any other language. This is in sharp contrast with her contemporary Beatrix Potter and other cultural iconic children's fantasy writers, such as J.K. Rowling and Enid Blyton, who are still widely published internationally. Even within Australia, whilst, you, whilst while, sorry, while she was well known in the 20th century, her popularity has declined over time and she is little known by younger generations and first generation immigrants in modern day Australia. With dwindling royalties, the copyright holders themselves have allowed redrawn and rewritten versions of her children's stories by other authors and illustrators to be published, with nonetheless uh, her iconic signature on the cover. 
Revival of her popularity was recently seen with the 100th year anniversary of her most famous children's book, Snugglepot and Cuddle Pie, in 2018. Since 2016, one of the Sydney Harbour ferries was named after May Gibbs, and her work has featured and her work has featured in the Harbour Light and Sound show, Vivid Sydney. Tim DeHaan, the artist who painted a two-story street art mural that pays tribute to May Gibbs, summed it up when he said, the mural attracts the interest from young and old. The, the older generation, like my mother and grandmother, grew up with the stories of May Gibbs, while the younger generation is attracted by the artwork. A commemorative blue plaque modeled on the famous blue plaques of London, promoting key heritage sites, people and stories, was to be unveiled last June. She also has a plaque in her name on the New South Wales Government's Writers' Walk beside Sydney's Oprah House, which features other notable authors with a link to Australia, such as Charles Darwin, D.H. Lawrence and Mark Twain. Likewise, her design can be found in Australian home, even a home baked pie, not the pan or cuddle pie. Despite this recent commemorative outburst, a literary movement is in its infancy related to the recognition of the Aboriginal people, expressing sadness, disappointment and anger over the depiction by Australian non-native writers of the bush they've always, always lived in. For the first time, even May Gibbs' idyllic vision of the Australian bush has come into question. Two poems recently published by the Australian indigenous poet Evelyn Araluen, entitled Fran Yoran Gully and Mrs. Kukabara Addresses the Natives, are considered to savage and mock both the May Gibbsian vision of the bush and her use of, languages of, of language in her children's book. To my knowledge, this is the only criticism of this nature. Let's hope it doesn't swell into a counterculture movement. So finally, I hope I've sparked your interest in this iconic, popular and prolific workaholic and that you enjoy the picture I've drawn of the abundance and scarcity conundrum in May Gibbs' life and work. I'd like to close by acknowledging the joint copyright May Gibbs Holder, the, North, the Northcote Society and Cerebral Palsy Alliance, and in particular Stephanie Lake and Rosalie May, who gave me permission to reproduce May Gibbs' copyrighted images and texts.